Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. Welcome. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. At least 47 people were killed following a Russian airstrike in Ukraine, making it one of the deadliest attacks since the war began more than two years ago. Flames fans set up makeshift memorials at the Sandalome in Calgary, honoring the late Johnny Gaudreau, who died in New Jersey last week. And it is back to school time. We are from officials with the Lethbridge School Division who discussed the new rules surrounding cell phones in classrooms. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Ukrainian officials say at least 49 people were killed in what appears to be one of the deadliest Russian strikes since the war with Ukraine began back in early 2022. They say two ballistic missiles hit a military training facility in central eastern Ukraine and at a nearby hospital, also injuring more than 200 others. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has ordered a full and prompt investigation into the events leading up to the attack. Firefighters in Ukraine discuss how the Russian military has also been targeting its power grid during a series of recent attacks. New details are emerging as to the condition of the hostages whose bodies were recovered by the Israel Defense Forces in Gaza. According to TBN Israel's Yair Pinto, the hostages were shot by members of the terrorist group Hamas multiple times. He also says that the IDF continues to dismantle a lot of Hamas's infrastructure within Gaza City. The IDF continues to clear Hamas tunnels and terrorist infrastructure in Gaza City, while also continuing to carry out security sweeps in Judea and Samaria, while defending the northern border from Hezbollah rocket attacks. On Israel's home front, there are sharp disagreements arising over the necessity of holding on to the Philadelphia corridor bordering between Egypt and the Gaza Strip. Hamas is demanding that the IDF withdraw from this strategic point in exchange for the remaining hostages, sparking an agonizing debate in the Knesset and in the streets of Israel. Meanwhile, Israel is allowing the United Nations to carry out a campaign of vaccination against polio in the Gaza Strip, while the United States is stepping up its military pressure on the Houthis in Yemen. A recent hot button issue here in Canada is how the Trudeau government has been handling immigration. It is an issue that exploded on the immigration file of Ahmed El Didi, the man accused in a terror plot and a participating in an ISIS video showing another man being dismembered. Now, how can the government claim the system worked as it should when the man received Canadian citizenship? Political columnist Brian Lilly gave us his thoughts. It was shocking to watch Dominic LeBlanc, who is... In, in my view, one of the most politically astute of Justin Trudeau's ministers. And that's why Trudeau uses him as his fixer. And he's there at committee being questioned by the Conservatives of how this guy was allowed not only to get into Canada, but get citizenship. And he just kept saying the system worked as it should. He was trying to put all the focus on how police operated once they had the tip-off, did not want to admit that there was a failure in letting this man into the country. Mr. Lilly will discuss how so many Canadians have lost faith in our country's immigration system. That's coming up later in our broadcast. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev continues his cross-country Axe the Tax Tour. Now at a recent stop at a construction company in Ontario, he also discussed his plan for building more homes, which he says is possible by simply eliminating a lot of the bureaucracy which slows the process down. We don't have enough homes. We have the fewest homes per capita of any G7 country. We have fewer homes per capita than we did 10 years ago. Our population has been going, growing by 3% while our housing stock grows by 1%. So, you know, we built fewer homes last year than we built in 1972 when our population was half of what it is now. It, it's just very simple. If you have an island with 10 homes and 20 families, you're going to have a lot of homeless people on that island. So we have to accelerate home building. Um, home building is extremely profitable if you can get a permit. 
So there's nothing stopping, there's no market failure preventing builders from building homes. What's stopping them is that it takes seven or eight years to get a permit. There are these horrendous fees. There's tremendous confusion and complexity about what is allowed and what's not allowed. The Bank of Canada is expected to cut its key interest rate on Wednesday for the third consecutive time. The rate is currently sitting at 4.5% following a quarter point cut in June and July. Now Canada's inflation rate dropped to 2.5% in July. Meanwhile, Stats Canada will release its labour force survey for August later this week. The economy dropped 2,800 jobs in July and the unemployment rate held steady at 6.4% for the month. The Alberta government says students going back to school will have more choices to explore career education in communities across the province. Officials say seven new collegiate school programs will begin this year to enhance career education opportunities. The new collegiates will offer students programming in areas such as science, aviation, technology, engineering, business and agriculture. It's important to me that uh, we continue to enhance career education. This is a priority of the government of Alberta so that we can make sure our students have every opportunity that they need to pursue their passions and succeed in our dynamic, fast-paced and competitive job market. Whether it's through the opening of new collegiate schools or the expansion of other education pathways, we're working together with schools, communities, post-secondary partners and industry to make sure that we're able to offer a wide range of exciting and rewarding learning opportunities for students. While collegiates are just one part of the career education equation that already exists in our education system, the collegiate model does indeed create new opportunities for students to pursue more specialized and focused programming alongside their regular courses. Many questions remain over new sex ed rules the provincial government has promised. That's according to Jason Schilling, president of the Alberta Teachers Association. Schilling says he does not understand what was wrong with the old system and that students now risk missing out on valuable information. The province has said it is moving ahead with legislation that would require parents to proactively opt in rather than opt out of lessons in sexual health. Education Minister Nicolaiti says legislation is being proposed on the subject this fall. Well, it was back to school for many students here in Alberta. Over 12,000 students returned to their classrooms here in Lethbridge. With them, certain new policies and procedures enforced by the Lethbridge School Division that will be implemented. Mike Nightingale, superintendent for the board, discussed cell phone restrictions being placed on students. He says the rules are different depending upon what grade they're in. There are more restrictions at the elementary level, um, less restrictions at the high, high school level, and middle school was somewhere in between. So we also wanted to tailor the procedure to some of the things that are already occurring in the schools to hopefully make that transition a little bit easier. And then in terms of social media, uh, generally speaking, social media isn't going to be accessed on our, our networks unless it's for educational purposes. So really what we're asking for from people in our school communities are patience as we roll this out and figure this out. It's going to look a little bit different at every school. There'll be some commonalities. And then partnership, that we want as schools want to work together with parents and guardians, with students, how to figure out the best ways to implement this procedure. And that reminder that the goal is to improve our learning environments for students. There's a lot of benefits of personal mobile devices, but they also can create some challenges and some distractions. So we're really just trying to, to minimize those things. We're very fortunate to be a growing school division. We're excited to serve more families and more members of our school communities. It does create some challenges when you grow and there's always uh, staffing that needs to be figured out and budgets and those sorts of things. The Lethbridge School Division continues to grow. Allison Purcell, board chair for the Lethbridge School Division, says a boundary review for their Westside Elementary School is coming. A September board meeting will provide the opportunity to offer them feedback for approving the boundary changes for the new elementary school coming next fall. Purcell also discusses the importance of an increase to their base grant funding to support students. Uh, a growing school division, we need space and this is definitely a welcome relief to have this new school opening next September. So over the summer there was also the announcement of additional funding to the base grant for our students. We certainly as a school division advocate strongly that we need to be able to fund every student that's in our schools. So it was definitely welcoming to hear that those that base funding will be increased but it is definitely not enough and we still won't have enough for every student. So as a board we'll continue to do the advocacy that we need to to ensure that every student is funded in our schools. Lethbridge Polytechnic kicked off a new academic year with a new identity and a new focus. 
The institution held its new student orientation on Tuesday. It's the first time since the educational institution changed its name from Lethbridge College to Lethbridge Polytechnic this summer. President and CEO Brad Donaldson says while there's a lot of excitement about the name change, the biggest highlight of the new school year is an improvement to student wellness supports at the institution. We've spent a significant amount of money in the last uh, few months creating a new wellness and support center for students, uh, increasing needs that we see in students for academic and uh, health and wellness supports. That'll be the big change, uh, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to their learning and the programs that we offer that are giving them great starts to, or continuation of their careers. I absolutely love this time of year. The energy, you can feel the energy as you walk through the halls. We're pleased that um, nearly 1,500 new students registered to attend this day, which is the kickoff to their post-secondary career um, here at Lethbridge Polytechnic. Last year for the full academic year, we ended, we landed about, uh, they're called 4,700 4, uh, full learning equivalents. Um, so about 7,000 students uh, all said and done. Um, and we have about 25% of those students uh, in credit programming uh, are international. Um, about 20, 21% overall are international when you include our apprentice students. Um, apprenticeship really did uh, grow last year. Uh, so we saw kind of a good growth there. Um, and uh, what we're hoping is that growth continues um, as we kind of meet the needs of the labor market. The new student orientation featured guided tours of campus, a barbecue hosted by the Students Association, a nature walk, and even a movie. Classes begin for the fall semester on Wednesday. Emergency crews in Lethbridge responded to a commercial fire on Sunday evening at the 1500 block on 2nd Avenue. At around 6 p.m., fire crews from four stations promptly responded to the blaze and put it out before it could spread to neighboring locations. Fortunately, there were no injuries, and the investigation into the fire's origin and cause are ongoing. The cost of the damage is estimated to be around $300,000. Lethbridge police arrested a 25-year-old man on Saturday after he was caught excessively speeding down Mayor McGrath Drive South on a motorcycle. At around 9.30 p.m., Brendan Campbell of Brooks was caught weaving in and out of traffic, splitting lanes, and traveling up to 140 kilometers an hour. Campbell was issued multiple violations tickets that totaled around $1,200. That included dangerous operation of a motor vehicle and various vehicle equipment violations. The motorbike has since been impounded. Campbell is set to appear in court on September the 23rd. The City of Lethbridge is reminding residents to be cautious around Henderson Lake in the last days of summer as the cyanobacteria advisory remains in place. Cyanobacteria, commonly known as blue-green algae, appears as fuzz or globs in the water and gives, gives off a bit of a musty or grassy smell. Algae blooms typically form in hot and calm weather. Contact in water with cyanobacteria can often lead to symptoms ranging from rash and irritation to fever, nausea, and can also be fatal to pets. The city treats the lake monthly with beneficial bacteria, but there are no direct treatments to stop or control algae blooms. Residents and visitors are advised to avoid all contact with affected waters and to also avoid fishing in the area. John Dirksen, research chair of the Polytechnic Aquaculture Centre of Excellence, says Henderson Lake has a history of algae blooms. This lake, uh, Henderson, is not, uh, it has a history of having algae blooms. Um, and the city has been working on a long-term solution of managing those with, like when the aeration came in. Just because you have an algae bloom, it doesn't mean you have a toxic situation. Uh, first of all, it's only certain types of blue-green algae that can produce toxins. Most blue-greens only release the toxin after they die, so as the cell ruptures. Um, but <clears throat> you can have two water bodies, both having the same intensity of algae, uh, same types of algae, and one can be producing toxins and the other is not. For its part, City of Lethbridge officials say toxicity testing is not available unless done through Alberta Health Services. The city also says they've been in contact with AHS all summer, but since this is not a swimming lake, they've not taken over any testing. You know, while we're still enjoying the last days of summer, the City of Lethbridge has locals who live on a snow route to consider an optional service that will be piloted in the first two weeks of this month. City Transportation Manager Julianne Rock says although snow clearing can be inconvenient, the city hopes to offset the frustration with increased communication. 
She says that the project was born out of increased concerns from residents who were temporarily blocked in their driveways to wait for the snow clearing process to complete. Council directed us in July to create um, an assistance service that allows these residents to have easy access to their properties. So today we are um, distribute, starting to distribute postcards announcing the program. Residents can call in starting September 16th until September 27th to sign up for this assistance program. It's especially gauged towards people with mobility challenges and we would really ask residents to consider and really assess their situation because the program is designed for people in need. So hard to talk about snow when we've had temperatures over 30 degrees for the past week. Calgary Flames fans stopped by the Saddle Dome in Calgary over the long weekend to pay their respects to former Flame hockey great Johnny Gaudreau. They brought bottles of purple Gatorade, flowers, handwritten notes, jerseys and even bags of Skittles. Gaudreau and his brother Matthew were tragically killed by a suspected drunk driver while cycling near their childhood home in New Jersey. Johnny actually was the reason why I became a Flames fan and it was like just to hear that news this morning has just been devastating. It wasn't just about him on the ice, it was what he did for our community. Like giving of his, he was so giving of his time. I mean, of course he's, he is a great hockey player, but just what he gave back to the community, to the kids and to the community at large was just, that's what really brought me to him. Like he's a really great player. The impact on the team and the sports and the, the hockey, it's, it's, it's so much. And, we could talk about that for days and about the impact he had on the ice, but it's really the impact off the ice. I think that was really huge to what he was. He loved this community. He loved his family. And um, yeah, you know, it's been <laughs> it's been a hard day just having to deal with a lot of these raw raw feelings. I know a lot of Flames fans uh, held this family and this player close to our hearts. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a father, it's a brother, and uh, Matthew as well. You know, we're we're just devastated to hear about this news. Johnny Hockey will certainly be missed. Well, it was sunny and warm as we made our way back to work and school today, and that trend should continue. Full weather details are on deck. Well, we got up to the high 20s in Lethbridge again today. A nice hot day for heading back to school and work following the Labor Day long weekend. Tonight, it should be mainly clear with a low near 12. Wednesday, expect lots of sunshine on tap, but cooling off slightly to about 24. Thursday, the mercury should increase again to around 29 degrees. Friday, even hotter with a high expected near 32. And a nice weekend is shaping up so far. It should be mainly sunny and 31 degrees on Saturday, sunshine and 33 on Sunday. Monday, we could see a record with a high expected near 34 degrees. Now, the average high for this time of year is 22 degrees with an average low of 7. The record high was set not long ago, 2022 at 36 degrees, and the record low was plus two set way back in 1962. The sun rose at 651 and will set at 809. Let's see how the rest of the country is shaping up for Wednesday now. Expect loads of sunshine on the west coast. It should go up to 25 degrees in Victoria, sunny and 23s on tap for Vancouver. Edmonton and Calgary should both be sunny on Wednesday with a high of 20 degrees for both cities. It should be partly cloudy in many regions of Saskatchewan. 23 is the high expected in Regina. Cloudy and 21 is on tap for Saskatoon. Winnipeg should be mainly sunny with a high near 25 degrees on Wednesday. Now in the central part of the country, it should be mainly sunny in both Toronto and Ottawa with a high near 25 degrees. Montreal, lots of sunshine as well with a high expected near 25. Beautiful days in central Canada. In Atlantic Canada, expect a sunny sky with a high of 23 degrees in Fredericton, sunshine at 22 for Halifax, sunshine at 21 in Charlottetown, and in St. John's, expect lots of sunshine as well with a high near 18 degrees on Wednesday. Chorus Entertainment has over a billion dollars in outstanding debt. Company officials have negotiated an amendment to a credit agreement with its lenders to give it some increased breathing room as it works to deal with financial issues. The Toronto-based broadcaster says the maximum total debt-to-cash flow ratio required under its financial covenants has been increased to 4.75 through to and including October 15th. Under an earlier agreement, it had been set to decrease to 4.25 times from 4.5 times on September the 1st. The amended deal includes requirements to use excess cash to repay outstanding balances 
and certain terms related to the use of proceeds on asset disposals and other conditions. Canadian gas station operator Parkland is looking to sell its Florida-based retail and commercial businesses. The Calgary-based company's operations in the state include about 100 retail locations, nine card lock facilities, and four bulk storage plants and warehouses. It's part of Parkland's decision to sell non-core assets, which is expected to bring in more than $500 million by the end of the year. Parkland operates around 4,000 gas stations in Canada, the United States, and the Caribbean, under numerous brands including Ultramar, Esso, and Pioneer. It also has an oil refinery located in Burnaby, B.C. Former Volkswagen Group CEO Martin Winterkorn has gone on trial on charges of fraud and market manipulation. It comes nine years after U.S. environmental authorities discovered the automaker's use of rigged software that caused vehicles to cheat on emissions tests. Winterkorn rejects the charges against him, which could bring up to 10 years of jail time if convicted. The diesel scandal had wide-ranging consequences for the company and the auto industry. Volkswagen ended up paying over $34 billion U.S. in fines and legal settlements. Meanwhile, sales of diesel-powered cars, once favored for their fuel efficiency over gasoline-powered vehicles, plunged as a share of the car market in Europe. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 303 basis points to 23,042. The Dow was down 626 basis points to 40,936. The S&P 500 was down 119 points to 5,528. And the Nasdaq was also down 577 points to 17,136. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $3.21 to $70.34 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up two cents to two dollars and nineteen cents U.S. Gold was down four thirty-seven to two thousand four hundred and ninety-two dollars and eighty-three cents U.S. an ounce, and silver was down forty-eight cents to twenty-eight dollars and four cents U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at seven dollars fifty-four cents per bushel. Barley is at five seventy-three. Canola is at thirteen forty-three, and corn is at seven dollars. 32 cents per bushel. Live cattle October contract was down $1.30 to $183.15. Feeder cattle September contract was up 90 cents to $241.38. And lean hogs October contract was up 90 cents to $87.33. And the Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours and sits currently at 73 cents US. Recapping one of our top stories, Ukrainian officials say at least 49 people were killed in what appears to be one of the deadliest Russian strikes since the war with Ukraine began in early 2022. They say two ballistic missiles hit a military training facility in central eastern Ukraine and at a nearby hospital, also injuring more than 200 others. The issue of illegal guns being smuggled into Canada from the United States is becoming an even bigger problem. Political columnist from the Toronto Sun, Brian Lilly, will share details with us momentarily. When you see news happening in your community, drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. It appears as though the Trudeau government is being pressed to enact new gun control regulations to combat domestic gun violence. Now to chat about this in more detail is Sun political commentator Brian Lilly who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, you say the bigger problem when it comes to gun crime is really the amount of illegal guns which are making their way up into Canada through the United States? And that was put on display here in the Toronto area just last week on a single day uh, police in three jurisdictions. It wasn't one of these big uh, operations that involved multiple jurisdictions, just Toronto Police, Peel Regional Police, which is Mississauga and Brampton, and Durham, which is the suburbs to the, uh, the east of the city. They all announced a ton of arrests. How 98 people arrested, uh, 49 guns seized. It, these were people who were trafficking in guns and drugs. Over 1,000 charges laid across these three jurisdictions all announced in one day. And when you, you know, 
spoke to the, the police officers, the chiefs involved, they would tell you that there is a major problem with guns being smuggled up from the border. Out in Durham region, they broke up what they said was a gun trafficking ring that uh, stretched all the way from uh, places like Oshawa to British Columbia in, in terms of their gun trade. And th they are uh, smuggling guns in from the United States, selling them to other criminal elements here in Canada. So, look, I, I don't want to say that these uh, regulations that uh, the, the gun control groups are press pressing for are, are not important. They are, and they're probably ones, most of them, uh, would be ones that e even strident uh, gun rights advocates would support because it's around you know, someone who uh, was convicted of domestic violence not being able to get a gun. That's pretty much people are on board with that sort of thing. But again, the problem with the Trudeau government is they always focus on legal licensed gun owners and finding ways to make their life more difficult when the gun violence that we see in our streets is driven by smuggled guns, whether it's in Alberta or British Columbia or here in Ontario. It doesn't matter where you are. That's the major source for guns coming in. And, and you look at many of the guns that are uh, seized by police and they'll put out a photo saying, you know, we seized 20 guns, what have you, in this raid. And there's the photo and you look and, and they're prohibited. They're guns that you can never legally buy in Canada. So the Trudeau government needs to adjust its focus from uh, constantly on, on the side of legal licensed gun owners and adding more and more regulations. And if they want real bang for their buck, pardon the pun, then they've got to uh, put the focus on the border. And you know, Brian, a recent poll says Canadians have really lost faith in the Trudeau government and its ability to handle the immigration issue in our country. Are we moving towards the same place as the United States when it comes to immigration being a real hot button issue right now? Well, I hope not, because it's a very polarizing and divisive issue in the United States. Now, to some degree, the uh, the Trudeau liberals have been trying to import the American rhetoric around immigration to Canada. A and so down in the United States, there is very little distinction between legal immigration and illegal immigration, primarily because the biggest source of immigration are people that come across the border into the United States illegally. In Canada... It's the opposite. We have had, until recently, a well-functioning immigration system. But a few things have happened. The Trudeau Liberals decided they were going to take it from about the 250 to 300,000 people a year coming as permanent residents that we saw during the Harper years that was not controversial at all. A couple of years ago, they decided we want to ramp that up to 500,000 a year. They're now even questioning that. Um, the illegal immigration side, people coming and claiming asylum as soon as they get here, when they were allowed entry as a, a, on a visitor's visa, that's a major issue. It's undermining faith in the system, the temporary foreign workers program, the prime minister admitting last week that things have gotten out of control on that. All of that has led to a, a, a sense from many Canadians that we're bringing in too many people too fast, 65% in the most recent Leger poll for Post Media. It mirrors a poll done for the Association of Canadian Studies a few months ago. And that was the one where they've been tracking this question every year for a number of years. And you want to go back five years, just 35% said we have too many people coming in. Now it's 65 in two consecutive polls. That tells you that things are going badly. And the Trudeau Liberals, in my view, have broken the consensus on the immigration system. They've broken the system and how Canadians feel about it. And Brian, a recent issue that really exploded on the immigration file is the case of Ahmed El Didi, the man accused in a terror plot and a partaking in that ISIS video showing another man being dismembered. So how can the government really claim the system is working as it should when this guy received Canadian citizenship? It was shocking to watch Dominic LeBlanc, who is, in, in my view, one of the most politically astute of Justin Trudeau's ministers. And that's why Trudeau uses him as his fixer. There's a, a ministry that's had a problem. Guess who goes in there? Dominic LeBlanc. Every prime minister tends to have someone like that. LeBlanc is the fixer for Trudeau. But he's also been around politics his whole life. His dad was a Trudeau, a Pierre Trudeau cabinet minister. Uh, his dad was governor general. Uh, so he knows his way around politics, and he's there at committee being questioned by the conservatives of how this guy was allowed not only to get into Canada, but get citizenship. And he just kept saying the system worked as it should. He was trying to put all the focus on how police operated 
once they had the tip off, did not want to admit that there was a failure in letting this man into the country. They, they just tried to walk past that. But they did release a timeline of how he came to Canada. And he was first denied entry in December 2017. Officials at the uh, embassy, and I believe it was in Cairo, said, no, we don't think you're a true visitor, meaning they believed he was going to sh show up in Canada and declare asylum um, wh while coming on a, a tourist visa. So they said no to him. The next month, he provided more paperwork, more information. They said, OK, you're approved. Came in February 2018, June of that year, he declares asylum. Then he gets his permanent residency. Then in May of 2024, he became a Canadian citizen. Just May. He was arrested in July. The, the, the police were on to him in June. So he gets citizenship wow. and then is allegedly plotting to cause a mass casualty event in Toronto. He was put through security several times. And we have to be really concerned about this, Hal, because they keep saying this is the same type of security they're using to screen people coming in from Gaza. We've got 5,000 people coming in from an area controlled by a terrorist group. You have to know that Hamas is going to try and get their people out and into Canada, globalize the intifada, as they say, but also because Hamas is losing to Israel in their war. So they're going to be trying to get people out. And the government says, don't worry, biometrics. Well, that's a nice buzzword. It means fingerprints. And if they don't find your fingerprint in a Canadian database, you're getting through. This shows that we need better screening, that the system didn't work properly, but the Trudeau government doesn't want to admit that, either for Mr. El Didi or for the 5,000 Palestinians that are coming in from a war zone. Well, yeah, it sounds like Canadians should be concerned about a lot of the immigrants being vetted properly, Brian. Now, we just had Labor Day, and over the long weekend, a video of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau being confronted by a steel worker has gone viral. This man was not too happy with the Prime Minister. I saw the video as well, and many of his policies. Brian, who is winning the actual blue-collar vote in Canada right now? Right now, it would be uh, Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives. Um, Justin Trudeau clearly doesn't have the vote of that man at Algoma Steel in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Uh, Trudeau showed up with donuts and, uh, and got an earful instead uh, of a thank you. So uh, Polyev has been going to places. He was at Stelco Steel in Hamilton a little while ago. Now, Stelco is the unionized. There's two big steel mills in Hamilton. And Stelco is the unionized one. And local 1005... Uh, some of those guys are, are really hardcore on the union stuff and not normally a, a, you know, a blue voter. They were applauding and loving Pierre Polyev. It was remarkable. So you, you can see where Polyev is, is reaching through half of men who are more likely to be doing blue collar jobs. Almost half of men, 47 percent, say they will be voting for Polyev and the conservatives in the next election. That's a staggering Staggering level of support. Uh, Polyev also released his own video saluting the workers on Labor Day and, and talking about people, you know, the country's built by those who rise before uh, the sun is up and, and work hard and don't worry, you're going to have a, a better future going forward. It's really interesting because he's putting that out as a salute. That's going to get him some, you know, people will feel warm and fuzzy about it, kind of a morning in America, uh, Ronald Reagan type ad. Jagmeet Singh put out an attack ad against Polyev. This tells you that he's getting the, the unionized blue-collar vote because he put out an attack ad against them. But it wasn't a pipe fitter who was uh, denouncing Pierre Polyev. It was two unionized union leaders, the head of the BC Federation of Labor and the head of the Ontario Federation of Labor, both who come from public service job backgrounds. That's who the NDP still has, uh, civil servants, whereas Polyev is taking the blue-collar vote. Brian, Prime Minister Trudeau was in Halifax recently for his cabinet retreat, where ministers voiced support and really urged him to stay on as leader. Now, next week, he'll be in B.C. for a caucus retreat. Will he receive the same support there? Probably not. Um, what we'll be looking for at that caucus retreat is, does anyone break ranks? And that's happened before. You think of uh, Jean Chrétien, in the early 2000s. I believe it was at a, a caucus retreat just like this in, uh, might have been Northern Quebec, and, and he had people breaking ranks, saying he had to go. And, and what's remarkable about that is 
uh, Kretchen had just won his third majority. He wasn't someone who was down at 24, 23% in the polls and fading. Uh, Kretchen was still wildly popular, and they still said he had to go. So there's been some mutterings. Will they break out in the open? That's what I think everyone's going to be watching for. And, and when you've got that many people, it's harder to keep everyone in line than it is, uh, uh, say, just a, a, a cabinet that's much smaller. Wayne Long, who's not running again, he's already said that Trudeau should go. Is anyone else that is either not running or in a seat that's really threatened, will they step up and say, you know what, he's got to go? I mean, what about someone like uh, George Halal in Calgary? Show, I mean, his seat is going to be threatened for sure. I think he should be one of the people saying the PM's lost touch with, uh, with Canadians. Uh, this is not good for Alberta. It's time for him to step down and have fresh leadership. Two more by-elections are coming up. Do you think the Trudeau government could lose more seats like they did with the recent Toronto by-election win by the Tories? Absolutely, they could. Uh, they only hold one of the two seats. So there's the uh, by-election in Elmwood, Transcona. Uh, that's in Winnipeg area, northeast part of the city. That's primarily thought to be a battle between the NDP and the Conservatives. Uh, the Conservatives have nominated a, a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, back to the blue-collar thing. The NDP nominated a, uh, a executive director of a business improvement association. So kind of reversed roles here. Uh, but, you know, I, I wrote about this recently, about the battle being between them. And, and I had some people write and say, you know what, the, the NDP is taking a beating and the Liberals, you know, might put up a fight. I think if the NDP takes a beating, the Conservatives win the, the Winnipeg riding, which they held uh, have held in the past from 2011 to 2015. Montreal uh, is a riding called La Salle et Marde Verdun. That was held by David Lametti. Prior to that, years ago, it was held by Paul Martin in the, uh, you know, when he was before Prime Minister and when he was Finance Minister. The NDP are threatening that one. They held that from 2011 to 2015. They've nominated a popular councillor, a uh, city councillor to, to run in that area. The Liberals have appointed someone who's a borough councillor. That's a, a lower level municipal official in Montreal's bizarre uh, city po political system. So the NDP have a real shot at, at taking that one. And if they do, wow. I mean, you can imagine that uh, Trudeau would face more pressure if he lost that one. Brian, journalist Andrew Coyne wrote a recent op-ed in the Globe and Mail discussing how Pierre Polyev is not very likable. He says if he wasn't so unpleasant, he might get more of a hearing for his agenda. Now, many Canadians you and I have chatted with, Brian, would argue otherwise, saying Polyev is quite likable and that you really shouldn't release all of the details of your platform before you're elected since the Trudeau government could potentially use some of them. Well, they're already stealing ideas from him, especially on housing, uh, although they're doing it badly. Uh, they're doing it, uh, you know, dealing with federal lands in a way that essentially amounts to you will own nothing and be happy because they want to lease the land rather than sell it so that you can buy a home and live on a plot of land that you own. They want to lease it. Um, so they are stealing his ideas. But I saw that uh, column from Andrew Coyne and it, it just left me puzzled. Like he knows how to read a poll. And 43% in the latest Leger poll say they are voting for Pierre Polyev. 47% of men, 40% of women say they're voting for him. He's doing far better than the Trudeau Liberals, far better than Jagmeet Singh. And you look at other polls as well that, you know, best prime minister, he is doing about double what Trudeau and Singh are garnering when it comes to best prime minister. So, I mean, how much more support does he want? Coyne is someone who has made it clear he does not like Pierre Polyev doesn't think he's the right type of conservative. Uh, but, you know, Coyne sits in his fancy restaurant in Rosedale in Toronto, writing his columns, looking down his nose at the rest of Canada. Uh, the rest of Canada is looking at, at Polly Evans saying this is a better alternative to, uh, to Justin Trudeau. So I, I really just don't understand it at all. Be contrarian if you want, Coyne, but, I mean, you, you got to base it in some facts. And the facts are Polly Evans is running away in every major poll. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you.
the human experience is replete with both triumphs and hurts. And as we know, some of the serious hurts are difficult to forgive. Now, is there a way to learn to live uh, with letting these pains go and living in peace and without the fruit of the pain? Joining us to discuss this is Reverend Tom Alba. He is a retired pastor who has served in several Lethbridge area reformed congregations. Pastor Alba, welcome to Bird City News. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Now, Pastor Tom, you've spent many a year as a minister, and we're all human. So is forgiveness a fairly common issue in the church for the people that you've counseled? Mike, I think it's the most common issue. Um, I remember with one church I uh, pastored in the States, uh, at one of my first meetings with one of the dear ladies who was a, uh, a servant in the church, um, she frankly told me, we, ha we have a real forgiveness issue in this church. And that was one of the first conversations. And yes, I mean, I, I think that's the main problem in the world today, not only in the church, but yeah, it's a real common issue. So what do you think makes it so common? Or maybe is it because forgiveness is hard to do? Um, well, it, it, it's not only hard to do, you can't do it without the love of Christ and without, you know, believing in him and his um, saving work on the cross for your forgiveness of sin. So in, in that sense, yeah, it's really hard to do. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I mean, you can make amends, you can uh, uh, pay back people, make restitution. There's all kinds of things you can do, but true forgiveness only comes through Jesus Christ. And yes, it's it's hard, and, and uh, some of the things we'll probably talk about will flesh that out a little bit. Right. Now, if God had a priority list of certain things, how high on that list do you think forgiveness would rank? Well, I've thought about that over the last 30 years of my pastorate, and um, my feeling is it's not like on a priority list. It's more like, I would say it like this, forgiveness is the essence of the gospel. That's the, the, the core issue of the good news, is that your sins are forgiven. Um, so if, if you're saying it by priority, there is nothing else that uh, is more important than that you forgive, uh, because Christ has forgiven you. Now, did the Lord, or I don't have to say did the Lord, uh, the Lord has given us an example of forgiveness. Can you talk about why the pe why people need to be forgiven by the Lord for their sins? Well, why? The, because the sin is. Uh, the main problem that men have in their rebellion against God, because if if you're not forgiven, then God's wrath burns against you, as the Bible says. Um, you can't forgive yourself. You don't have the power to do that. So, uh, and, and that's erroneous too. Most some people uh, say that you can forgive yourself or forgive uh, enough so that. Um, that you'll be saved, but that's not the case. Christ had to die for your sins, this horrible death. He had to go to hell for you in place of you for the punishment. And then he rose again to show us his victory over sin. So I guess that in, in some kind of short way explains why it has to be that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, circling back to the, the human side of this forgiveness equation, when someone has seriously wounded us, uh, it can be truly hard to forgive. Can you give us an idea of how to work through that forgiveness process and, and what steps might be involved? Yeah, I think, um, and I, I'm including myself in this, most most people that I run into, even in the church, they think forgiveness is an event, something you say or do, uh, but it's not. It's a, it's a journey. It's a process. I mean, it has to begin somewhere. 
So initially, you have to listen to the other person or uh, you have to talk to the other person about the issue that's at hand, and then it begins a process. And the process itself um, works in a, a manner of speaking towards different ends, like maybe there should be you want restoration, so you're trying to work through the issue. Uh, there's repentance, and repentance is something that takes time. In other words, you have to see that the person has changed if they ask you for your forgiveness to get some resolution or to get some restoration. So when we're talking about uh, a lengthy process, I can tell you sometimes um, it might take years. But the point is that the, t the person involved that's uh, seeking forgiveness or asking for forgiveness has to really want it in their heart. Uh, because that's the, like I said, it's the essence of the good news. I want to forgive and I, I will listen to forgiveness because I love Christ and he did that for me. So it sounds like we also need the power of Christ to um, extend the forgiveness, but also receive the forgiveness. Yeah, I mean, I think w probably you and I, Mike, we'd like to hear that uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those all sound, it's like a big cluster of grapes, mm -hmm. but they're all involved in the process, and that's the Spirit's work, because the Spirit works in our hearts to truly forgive uh, someone who has asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in my prayer life, it would be someone, you know, forgiveness sounds really nice until someone really hurts you. I mean, uh, Martin Luther said that. He, he said, uh, we should bear and forgive everybody in every situation, but then you don't know how someone hurt me. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how I lost my job. You don't know how I lost my marriage. Um, if you knew what this had done to me, you would be angry too. You deserve to suffer like I've suffered. Um, the only power in the universe that can really work with that is is the holy spirit in your heart so christ sends his spirit into your heart to work um the love that you need for the other person the peace that you need to to uh, not uh, be bitter and uh, resentful uh the joy that comes from knowing that uh, because christ forgive you now you can forget yeah. Now, further to that, how often have you seen perhaps a scenario like this where someone says, I forgive you, but, and then outcome <laughs> an unloading on the person who's asking for forgiveness. Is it okay to vent on how bad one was hurt? Well, vent is a, that's a good word you use, vent. I don't know if vent's the right word I want to use. It has to be done that someone has to tell you how much they hurt you. So, um, I've heard a lot of venting, and I understand where it comes from. It comes from a very hurt heart, if it's true. So, is it okay to vent? Well, in some cases, I'm going to have to listen. Um if if vent is a negative kind of shouting, screaming, um, and it includes a lot of badness and malice with it, I would say no. But I mean, in a sense, if you have to get it off your chest, I mean, great examples in the Bible where, um, especially with, you know, like um, David and Old Testament figures in uh, the gospel ministry of Christ, there are people who have had to come out and say, hey, look, this is what happened to me. So uh, I have learned to listen. <laughs> and sometimes it's venting. And maybe that's because the person doesn't know how to express it, except for the fact that they hurt so much. Yeah. So one of the verses I've been thinking a lot about this past week has been that Bible verse that says to guard your heart. 
above all else. Can you talk about how when someone's going through this difficult relationship pain or something uh, where they've been hurt, can you talk about how we can guard our hearts? To guard your heart means sometimes you have to set a boundary. And uh, I'm a great person for boundaries, even in my own family. And uh, because there are some things that are appropriate at some points with some people and some things not, uh, you might get hurt over and over and over again and forgive over and over and over again, but you want the hurt to stop. So you have to set a boundary and, and maybe you don't have that much to do with that person anymore or if anything at all. So there are methods where you can guard your heart uh, physically with a boundary that says, I don't go to their house or I don't have any fellowship with them anymore. Um, spiritually, um, sometimes you just come to an understanding that I've said this before, you know, I'm just not the right person to help you. And, and that's to guard my heart. Because as a pastor, I'll just tell you, I can empathize too much. And, um, and also, I'm a sinner. So I don't want that, that sin part that's left in me to come out and infect the person that I'm uh, being in a relationship with concerning these issues. So that's how I guard my heart. That makes sense. So when one does forgive a terrible wrong... Does it necessarily mean that one needs to reconcile with the individual? Yes and no. It depends on the individual. Hmm. Um, well, let's, let's just say in our own lives, maybe we've had an issue with someone and they passed away hmm. where you can't reconcile with them. Yeah. You moved away. You don't need to reconcile with them anymore. Uh, the hard part comes if they're in your church, in your community, and you have regular um, contact with them. Um, I don't think reconciliation is necessarily always required. Um, it is desired, if possible. You may never be the same kind of friend that you were before have the same kind of relationship where you did things together. Um, so that's a qualified answer. Yeah, I would always pursue reconciliation, but there may come a point where it's not possible. Right. So what happens if we, if we don't forgive? What are the consequences of walking down that road? Uh, that's, the Bible's pretty clear on that. I mean, the Lord's Supper, I mean, the Lord's Prayer, not the Lord's Supper. <laughs> Excuse me. Lord's Prayer says, forgive as, forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. Um, just let me read a couple of verses sure. here, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in Matthew 6, it says, if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others their sins, neither will your heavenly Father forgive yours. Hmm. I have to think about that a lot. There's also the parable of uh, the man who owed, I don't know, so many talents he couldn't pay his master back, and he was forgiven the whole thing. I think it's in Matthew 18. And then after that, he was forgiven the whole debt, which was impossible to forgive. He went out and then he he beat his servant for a minuscule amount of money and put him in jail because he couldn't pay his debt. And I and that's a parable Jesus tells to show us, you know, afterwards what's going to happen, which is the master who is the Lord himself puts his servant then into it's called a jail uh they're called jailers but in the original language they're actually tormentors so it sounds like it's just a terrible thing if you don't now that doesn't mean that it's going to make it any easier for me so 
I mean, uh, Paul talks about it in Colossians chapter 3. He says, put on, well, he, he tells you how to do it. He says, put on, as God's people, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven, you also must forgive. But above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So there's a, there is a pro it's, it's not an event. It's a process. I think, um, I have to get up in the morning and think about the Lord and the person. And I mean, sometimes, even though I don't love them, I have to say, Lord, please help me love them. Right. Well, that Colossians 3 is definitely the final advice to give our viewers who might be struggling with forgiving others. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you so much for being with us today, Pastor Tom. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. That was Reverend Tom Alba. He is a retired pastor who has served in several Lethbridge area reform congregations. I'm Michael Claussen, and for all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching, and happy Easter, for he has risen indeed.